we're going to turn to another contribution, and I'd like to invite uh, Kim and Chad up, please. Nice to meet you both. Just have a seat, switch the mics on. Okay, so another project um, uh, that emerged in the first year of the Empirical Educator Project uh, was around um, IRBs. Um, uh, so for the scholarship of teaching and learning, if you want to, um, as an educator, do some research that you actually want to publish, um, that counts as human science research. So. Uh, you have to go through your IRB, uh, which is the same board that would review, for example, uh, a, a medical research study or a psychology uh, study. Um, and these, um, these can be very um, involved processes, as they ought to be if you're conducting medical or psychological experiments. Um, and they can be very different from institution to institution because different institutions have different sorts, sorts of research emphases and, and because there really just aren't, aren't standards for these things. Um, so for education, which often doesn't fit the same mold uh, as these other sorts of research, um, it can become a barrier, especially if you happen to teach in a discipline where you're not used to going through the IRB process. So it turns out um, that both Carnegie Mellon and Duke universities uh, have um, both thought about this challenge and done some work um, in addressing this challenge for faculty to ease the way um, for their faculty who want to do research in the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, and um, because they're different institutions, um, they each came up with a, a, a novel and it turns out complementary solution. So Kim Mantaruk and Chad uh, Hershock are, are going to tell us about uh, those solutions, which they were um, the two in institutions were kind enough to contribute um, through uh, the Empirical Educator Project or um, um, under a Creative Commons license. Um, so, um, Kim, why don't we start with Duke? Um, so, uh, your project is called WALTER, which is a part acronym, right? Mm -hmm. For WALT stands for We Are Learning Too. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about that project and um, basically what it is and why you decided to take it on? Sure. Yeah, so uh, WALTER stands for We Are Learning Too, which is the first line in all of our student consent forms. When we ask students to share their educational data, they're always learning from us, so we say we are learning too. So that's where WALTER came from. Um, the origin of this project was I was talking with a faculty member about her research on cognitive science and distraction in the classroom. And I said, wow, this is really great. It would be fantastic if you could apply this to an educational setting here at Duke and do some research. And she said, I would love to, but I don't have time to get IRB approval. And I said, well, if I get it for you, will you do this? And she said, sure. So we went through that process. We started working um, with our IRB and figuring out what we needed to do to get that approved. Um, and we ended up creating the Walter tool, which is available through a Creative Commons license. It's a Qualtrics-based survey tool, but it can be used in any survey software. Um, and it basically goes through and asks faculty four or six questions about their research in plain English language. So it says, write one sentence telling me the question that you're researching. Um, write three bullet points telling me the data that you'd like to access. It's very accessible. It then takes that and puts it into a student consent form that our IRB has approved. Um, anyone using it would need to get their IRB to approve it as well. Because it's in Creative Commons license, if your IRB needed to make changes to that document, you could make changes to what the survey spits out 
um, and adapt it for your own use. Um, we then have it integrated with our learning management system. So once Qualtrics creates that student consent form, it can automatically appear in a course Sakai site for students. So when they go in to do their regular work in the course, they'll see a little button that says consent to do research. And they can click on that and they can indicate whether they're willing to share their data. Um, that's kind of where we started. That's the tool that we've made public. Um, since then, we came to the realization that if we want to make things even easier, it's one thing to make it easy for faculty to get IRB approval. We really want to make it easy for IRBs to approve. So we're trying to make both parties happy. So we're currently engaged in some work with our IRB to get a pre-approved form for standard educational research that bypasses a lot of the standard kind of review process because we're already ticking off the boxes that we're doing standard educational research, we're not shocking people, we're not doing anything that would require them to look at the ethics of the work. Um, so that's really been our approach. Um, one of the things that we're super excited about is when we started this project about a year and a half ago, it was taking on average about two months to go through an IRB process. Because you submit an application, they review it, they give you feedback, you change it, you apply again, et cetera. Um, our last project went through in under 21 days. So faculty are able to come to us and say, I'm doing this thing in my classroom next week and I want to research if it works. And we can say, we can make that happen for you. So it's been tremendous. We've seen scholarship on teaching and learning really take off. Um, and we would love to see other schools adopt that model. So we have, um, in addition to the Walter toolkit, we have a toolkit for how to set up that process at your school. So talk to me later and we're happy to share that as well. And are you seeing an increase in, yeah. Yeah. are you seeing an increase in the number of faculty who are coming to you for research? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I got three emails since I left to come on this trip. Uh, faculty saying, can I meet with you? I want to talk about an idea I have, um, which is one of the corollaries I think that goes along with this is we've tried really hard to staff our organization with the people who can fill that experience gap. Emily was talking about the challenges they've run into and one of them is that faculty don't have time to learn an entire body of literature on education research. And so we have people on our staff who are experts in that. So a faculty can email us and say, I want to study something about active learning. I don't really know what's already been done, but I want to try it out. And we can say, this is what's been done. This is a gap in the literature. Here's how you can implement it in your classroom. And we're also going to get the IRB to approve this for you in two weeks. So it's really taken off. Great. Now, Chad, I can mention something about wanting to make it easier for our IRBs to approve an a, a application through a template. I, I think you may be able to help her out. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what Carnegie Mellon has done? Sure. So to put in context a little bit, I'm part of the Eberly Center, which is our center for teaching and learning on campus. And we embrace evidence-based teaching in two ways. One is that we distill the peer-reviewed empirical education literature into practical strategies that you could use in your classroom next week, next month, next semester. But the other way that we embrace evidence-based practice is by helping faculty actually collect data on what they're doing and what's the outcome. Where did students start? Where did students end? And how does that inform your next teaching plan above and beyond intuition? And so that's really the genesis of where our approach came from. The other thing I, I need to qualify about it is there are lots of barriers that have been mentioned, both cultural and institutional for faculty adopting this work as part of their toolkit. And so while IRB is one, we actually take a systems approach where we try to lower the barriers or grease the rails in other ways, and I'm happy to mention those, but we were asked to talk specifically about IRB, um, where sometimes, sometimes folks <laughs> sit down uh, and, and they just want to make their course better. And other times the first thing they say in the chair is how can I publish on this? Um, and what, what we found is that we saw people reinventing the wheel, that you'd have 10 clients in a row who had to write the same IRB application and faculty are busy and it's a big, uh, it's a big time investment and the process um, isn't always easy. Um, and so we made a partnership with the IRB office and over six months worked with them to say, uh, here's what we're trying to do very transparently. We're trying to support these faculty collecting and interpreting data on their teaching. 
how can we do that in a way that's compliant with ethical standards? And so we work to create two broad IRB protocols. Um, one, I'll get a little jargony, is an exempt protocol, which basically means if you're only using data that's coming out of what students enrolled in the course have to do anyway, that's exempt. It's data that's embedded, it's a direct data source embedded directly in the course. And so we have one protocol for that kind of data that covers the most common designs that faculty would use. And so as long as you're coloring within the lines of those kinds of designs and data sources and working with the Everly Center, you don't have to write your own proposal. You're instantly covered um, as soon as you meet a couple bureaucratic hoops that you have to jump through. Our other broad protocol is expedited, which means now you have a data source that goes above and beyond what the students signed up to do as a student in the course. So if you want them to complete a survey, on self-efficacy or participate in a focus group or come back a month after the course is over to take a retention test or a transfer test. They didn't sign up for that, so now they have to sign a consent form. And again, there's a finite set of study designs that are common that if you're doing one of those things, you can be covered under our protocol as long as you're going to work with us closely. And I'll ask you the same question I asked Kim. Have you seen an impact in terms of faculty uh, uptake and research uh, since you've uh, develop these templates? Um, we have, and, and in part it's, I, I can't say it's entirely because of just those templates. That certainly makes it easier, but um, we also find that, as has been mentioned, that faculty sometimes need to augment their skill set to be able to do a project. And so we actually have a Teaching as Research Institute every June. We're about to do our fourth, which is on the surface is a crash course in classroom research methods. Under the hood, it's a way to funnel those faculty into our consultation services and our assessment consultants, which figure out, help you figure out how to do a project, how to measure something difficult to measure, like cultural competency, if that's your interest, collect and analyze the data, and then figure out what to do in your course. So as a sum total of everything that our teaching center is doing, we do see an uptick in those services and those requests and the number of faculty who are collecting either qualitative or quantitative data in their courses. And Kim, you have some uh, fellowships at Duke that do something somewhat similar, yes? Uh, most of our fellowships focus on different teaching pedagogies. We have an active learning fellowship. We have some course design institutes. One of the things we've started doing is integrating my department with those fellowships. So at the end, we come and we tell faculty, so you've learned some really interesting things. If you'd like to get a sense of how effective it is, here are the people that you need to talk to next. Um, we're also working with a number of different departments now to kind of foster a culture of scholarship around teaching. So we're starting journal clubs embedded within departments. Um, I, I keep talking about Emily, but one of the things that struck me was her comment that faculty like to learn about teaching specific to their discipline. So we'll go through and curate and say, here are articles that are relevant for teaching within quantitative physics and hard sciences. And then we'll bring faculty together and they'll read that and we'll use that as a launching point to help them develop their own projects. Okay, so what I'm hearing from both of you is that um, developing um, the capabilities uh, for faculty to navigate the IRB process is definitely important. It greases the wheels, uh, but it's, um, it's only, it, it's sort of the, the last link in the chain. You need to get them to that point first, and you each have a variety of, of methods by which you do that, and that you're culture building, mm -hmm. right? And, and this, is, um, this is just a way, a, a, an important way of lowering friction. Um, so I, I, I want you all to, to know not only that these pieces exist, and they are, they are complementary. It's interesting to me. I didn't know that you were actually working on the other piece mm -hmm. at, at Duke. Um, the, it would be great to, to see a number of institutions adopt and adapt these pieces. Um, that was always the intention. Um, so uh, please seek out these folks if you're interested in, in trying them out. I will also, um, I want you to know that we have uh, a number of participating vendors who are interested in these uh, projects uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, in, in one case, you know, it, uh, they tend to um, do research with uh, uh, universities anyway. Um, and 
they have to navigate one IRB at a time, right? This is also true for universities that want to conduct uh, multi-institutional research. It's just really hard if you want to do that because every IRB is different and if you can all agree on a common uh, uh, approval process that just makes it easier to do multi-institutional research uh, whether you're uh, an institution or a um, uh, or a vendor but the the other thing to remember is that while universities have to do that if they want to conduct uh, multi-institutional research uh, vendors do not right they don't have to publish they don't have to follow these protocols they have the data they can do whatever they want right and we have a, a number of vendors uh, in the network and probably some outside the network who would like to do the right thing but it's impractical for them to do so without some sort of standardization of this process right and if they could come out into the light um, and go through an academic process they have tremendous data that could give us some insight into teaching and learning. So that that's this is some infrastructure that could be very valuable. Um, is there anything else that either of you want to add uh, before we close? All right, thank you very much, Emily and Chad.